Anyway, the Odd Fellows. Uh, the building, by the way, I may have mentioned, uh, is 1878. Thank you. 79. We've been here since 79. Okay. Corrected. <laughs> 79. Actually, it was early 79. <laughs> but uh, actually, the Odd Fellows came here as a, a lodge, actually, in 1861. Right? 64? <laughs> the city of Victoria was 1862. A few of them came up from California with a gold rush of uh, 1858. From California, that's how our lodge, uh, that was their uh, sponsoring lodge. In any case, uh, tonight you might ask, uh, how did I meet Captain Duke Snyder? And it just so happens that uh, we share the same wall. <laughs> we, we live in a townhouse, and he's on the other side of the wall. <laughs> and um, for, uh, for some years, uh, Duke would uh, disappear for two or three months. And you know, it was a question, where, where, where'd he go? Absolutely. And then we'd hear stories when he came back that he had been up in the Arctic or someplace for the last three months. And it's, uh, you know, I started getting this image in my mind that, I don't know if any of you ever used to read Tintin, you know, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. there's Captain Haddock. Haddock, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, and I could just see a Tintin book, you know, like, yeah, yeah. you know, Tintin in the Arctic or something, because I get these little bits and pieces of stories that uh, Duke would come back with, and I'd kind of try to pull it all together, like, what, what's that, Where, what's he doing up there? And, so on. Well, it turns out, after a number of years, I got a fuller story, and uh, I put it in this introduction. Some of you I know have read it, but I'll, I'll uh, paraphrase it. Uh, uh, David Duke Snyder is a master mariner for more than 35 years at sea. He served on, as uh, onboard naval, uh, commercial, and coast guard vessels in the polar regions. Uh, the Baltic, Great Lakes, Northern uh, American waters. He retired from the Can Canadian Coast Guard uh, Service as a Regional Director of Fleet Western Region yeah. in uh, 2012. Uh, Duke today is the CEO and Principal Consultant of MarTech Polar Consulting. His uh, team provides a uh, ice navigation expertise to companies operating in the polar regions, giving them a competitive edge as they, uh, I don't want to say exploit, because maybe that's not a <laughs> <laughs> new economic opportunities in the Arctic, uh, to operate safely and uh, sustain uh, in such harsh navigational uh, conditions. Uh, his company is highly experienced and trained master. Mariners. As a recent president of the uh, Nautical Institute, uh, and last year he was disappeared over Scotland for most of the year, it seemed, or bouncing around all over. He seems, uh, he says that in spite of increasing public attention to the issues in the Arctic nav navigation, there's still many myths in the public mind that need to be dispelled. He feels that uh, the position, uh, uh, that position is ideal to give a balanced picture of the marine issues and operations in the polar con under polar conditions. So, without any more, <laughs> Captain Duke Snyder. Thank you very much, Beck. Uh, Beck and Carol have had the dubious honor of uh, having to sit still and listen to me tell sea stories at great length over wine and a few uh, other alcohol and uh, bits and pieces over the years and uh, he finally prevailed upon me to come down and uh, uh, force my stories on, on you folks as well. Um, I want to say right up front, I, I am not a scientist, I am not a researcher, I am a mariner. Uh, my job and the, the job of our people is to get ships in and out of the ice in both the Arctic and the Antarctic safely. So what I'm going to be talking about today is, is our view of what we see, um, some of the realities that uh, are quite counter to the myths that we often see 
in the, uh, the popular press. Uh, it is March, and true to form, at the end of February, there is always a host of articles that come out and say, ice-free Arctic summers are only 20 years away. <laughs> but that's been going on for 20 years, that the Arctic ice-free summers are 20 years away. They may come, but when they do come, it's going to be something very, very serious. I don't expect to see them in my lifetime, and hopefully not as a true ice-free summer. But I'd like to talk a little bit about that. The Arctic Internet game. As Kelly knows well, I often get muttering and grumbling when I see things on the internet. And another <laughs> clickbait answer comes out and it gets repeated and it starts to build up. And it, and it took me back to something that we used to do when we were kids, and I'm sure some of you have done it, where you play the phone game. You get a line of kids around a circle and someone comes up with a sentence and whispers it to the neighbor. And by the time it comes full circle, it has absolutely no bearing on what was originally said. And that is so often what now happens with the internet. In particular, when a, someone like myself, a subject matter expert, who sits and sees these headlines that get erroneously repeated again and again and again, and then it must be true. I saw it on the internet, that classic answer. So some of these bits and pieces, I'm going to pick on four in particular, and I'm going to talk about what the reality is as opposed to the myth, and then I'm going to do a, a few short pictures, but what I want to tell you and ask you to do is if you've got questions, please stop, because we're going to change subjects as we go along, and, and, it, and it's relevant if you've got something at the moment. So if we start off, we know what myths are like. The beauty, the glamour, that absolutely glorious unicorn. What is the unicorn in reality is a narwhal, not the same beautiful animal. But the myths of a unicorn and the unicorn horn came from something that mariners spotted in the Arctic wastes in the 1700s and took form in divisions. That's the kind of thing we have to deal with every day. Our myth number one is uh, really about global climate change. Number one, I am not a climate change denier. My team and I, we see the reality of global climate change, but we also see the hyperbole around it. What is happening, what is factual, is a gradual reduction in overall ice, but that is also happening in line with what have been ongoing cycles of what we call good and bad ice years. For a mariner, a good ice year is not so much ice. A bad ice year, lots of ice. What we see here is a trend, and this is important to look at, only since 1979, in this particular case to 2015. And we see an up and down through the annual curves, so that we have lots of ice, little ice. Lots of ice, little ice. In this short span, there are two major cycles of 11 years. We've known since the 1800s when ice mariners went up with the British and the, the, the European whalers that there are overall cycles of 11 years of good and bad ice years and 50 year cycles. An interesting fact when you get past all the hyperbole is over the last five years since that 2012, oh my God, the sky is falling, the Arctic is ice free, that happened to be the confluence of 50 year good and 50, 11 year good ice cycles. We're already seeing behind the anthropogenic change an increase in ice in a general way. But the anthropogenic change is still occurring. There is still this gradual reduction in an overall mass of ice and an overall thickness of an ice. But that in itself isn't a wonderful thing. It doesn't uh, bode well for shipping. What we have to look at within that is that variability exists. As long as there is ice in the Arctic waters, or for the Antarctic waters for that matter, it becomes a threat to shipping. We are not seeing anything close to ice-free summers. 
In 2012, uh, the then Admiral of the uh, MARPAC Command was in Reykjavik, or pardon me, Reykjavik, uh, Vladivostok, at an international conference with Russians and American Navy, and they were talking about what they're going to be doing collaboratively in the Arctic. This is 2012, before all sorts of nonsense has gone on recently. But while they were there, an article hit the New York Times that declared an ice-free passage <coughs> of the Northwest Passage. The Admiral had his aide get in contact with me, and he said, have Captain Snyder tell me, is this true or not? Well, it was true if you considered that ice-free meant less than 30% covered <coughs> by ice, so that there was 30% ice still on the, the surface of the ocean. And it only occurred for a period of about an hour until everything closed back in again. Mm -hmm. But is is that you, picture ice free? I can't, I, it's driving me nuts. Is that ice free or is that that free ice? I mean, what am I looking I, at there? Is that a shipping channel? No, that is a, ch a ship in nine tenths, ninety percent ice. So that's ninety percent ice. I'm just, right okay, there. now you can carry on. I, I'm looking. I'm going. Yep. Is that ice free? <laughs> that actually is the Louis S. Saint Laurent, Canada's uh, sure. oldest and most powerful icebreaker. Hmm. So that's almost. And it's still meeting ice like that every year today. But the point is that discussions. Yes. Just a quick question. What are you shipping? I always pictured that there was like nothing sort of up there. You shipping things from Alaska? I'm going to come to that. Okay, that's fine. In a little bit more depth, but I will tell you that the shipping is around resupply. It's around tourism. It's around uh, export exploitation. So natural resources are coming out, and that's where we're going to talk about the increases in numbers. So if, if this works well, okay, this is live. This is actually um, live and updated uh, daily from the National Snow and Ice Data Center in the United States. And what we can look at here are a number of trends. And again, this goes in a period of time right now, we're just going <coughs> several months. So that right there is uh, January, February through the year to December. So it looks at a year at a time. But on the table here, we go from 1979, there's that 1979 again, and today. So why is it 1979? Well, it's because everybody right now is depending on basing all of their prognostications on ice in the Arctic on satellite data that's only been available since 1979. Okay. Anything before 1979 doesn't register in any of these but we've had horrendously horrible ice years before that as pre 50 year cycle. So remember that 50 year cycle. This is not at a geological time scale. This is at a sub time scale that is that short that it doesn't factor in everything else. It's only very, very narrow. And when we look at this and we pick a particular year, if we come through this and we pick 2012, which is that dotted line. That looks like not much ice. So this is the total amount of ice in the Arctic. Winter time, summer time, and it came way down to here. This is only a 20 year mean. If we were to actually factor in anecdotal, a 100 year mean, it would be quite different. Do you have we don't have a 100 year mean in this particular depiction. How do we know that we do that? It's, it's anecdotal from ice navigators up there from um, the Franklin in the 1850s Sediments. being stopped by ice that 20 years later sailboats, sailing ships at the time were going through without meeting ice. So we don't have a complete map, but we have um, Canadian Coast Guard ships going up and saying, okay, we can't get through this area. We haven't been able to get through it for three years because of heavy ice. We don't have the capability to say there are X million tons, like this says. But we do know that there's something going on before it. But what I also want to show you is 2019. That's right there. Now, at the present moment, in the Canadian Arctic, 2019 winter, it's shaping up as one of the heaviest ice years in the last 10. Farther east, in the Bering Sea, it's one of the least, least heavy ice years. 
And that's part of the variability. We'll have a bad ice year here and a good ice year there. And when we get into showing you a couple of ice charts, you'll see how it, we can't just go charging through the Arctic thinking it's a good ice year. That's 2018 now coming into this. Whoops. And you'll see how it started out lower in the winter. This is part of the anthropogenic change. We are getting less old ice, less thick ice. We call it multi-year ice. And if there's less of it every year because of the slow anthropogenic drop, there's less in the summertime. But we noticed a massive increase in the summer last year. And I'll show you some pictures of that in a second. So, one of the misconceptions comes from a basic misrepresentation. These two images are very typically used um, in popular press and some of the, the my more hyperbolistic type uh, doom and gloom stories out there. And it shows, oh my God, look what it was like in 1984 and look what it's like in 2012. Well, that picture in 2012 seems to indicate that the entire Canadian archipelago is free of ice. What's wrong with these two pictures is they aren't of the ice, they're of a temperature gradient capable uh, or being measured from a satellite. <laughs> and this whole area here was actually covered by ice, but that particular depiction doesn't show it because it sh its temperature could possibly be seawater unfrozen, it could possibly be ice. What we choose to do is pick, in this case, the most pessimistic, in a mariner's side, the most optimistic. <laughs> but if I had tried to take a ship through the Northwest Passage based on that information, I would have been turned back long before I got anywhere through. Hmm. Is that on account of melt water on top of the ice that it throws it off? Or what? No, it is, it's purely based on temperature. And, and um, I'll get to an anecdote in a little while. Uh, about a situation where the, the growth of seawater ice begins when the, the seawater temperature is minus two Celsius and it's stable, it's not moving around. If you get air temperature that it starts to approach minus two, then it starts to freeze. If it goes below minus two, it starts to freeze very, very rapidly. With this, the problem with this particular picture is it's taken in the middle of the summer. You, you're not getting that differentiation between minus two seawater temperature and minus two air temperature. And the satellites can't make that differentiation. So they, they default to the less. We still get that today when we use what's called an AMSR satellite image when we're, we're trying to find out where the ice is. There will be a band of about 50 miles between where ice is hard and fast, we call it pack ice, and where there is no ice that this kind of satellite image shows as ice-free. What we need are um, uh, visible light, i.e. photographs from space, MODIS-type imagery, we call it, or radar sat, the Canadian satellites, that beams a radar down and bounces back. The radar sat type of image of ice is the most accurate. If I had had uh, an overall radar sat image of this, it would have shown the ice down here like this, and then into this part of the Canadian Arctic. So when you showed us the ice extent in different years, that extent would have been the area that you would measure on these diagrams, and it would be wrong? If you used that as the extent, it would be wrong. Mm -hmm. And but a true ice right. specialist will not use a thermographic, i.e. temperature, for that reason. Some. I, I don't want to keep you here all night, though, but um, it's... And I'm going to, uh, conversely, the whole coast of uh, Russia now is uh, more ice-free, so they now have more experience in shipping, new opening up of shipping channels and things, because the Canadian Arctic is locked, but there's more open space in the Soviet... Uh, no, that Russian, doesn't, that doesn't fall at all. The, 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 the truth is because Russia is spending billions upon billions of dollars on uh, resource exploitation and exploration, 
they're up in their own Arctic. Canada and the United States are not doing that sort of exploitation anymore, so we're not in our Arctic. That's where the difference comes in. It's not a difference because of, of ice. What we can move into, and I wasn't going to get into in, in this particular presentation, but I'll, I'll try and flip through, is with, when we look at global climate change, there are five um, accepted uh, climactic models, uh, computer models, that uh, scientists are using to try to determine how climate change is occurring. The five climate models agree on most things, but they're also in very, very large scale. And one of the problems with climate models is they can't predict what's going to happen in these islands. They can't predict what happens on a smaller scale, such large scale. But what all five climate models do predict as anthropogenic change continues, as the climate of the world gradually warms, and causes cold climate in other places, but the, the overall climate change is to warming. As the polar ice cap diminishes, due to the currents that exist, the first major openings in ice will occur along the Russian coast because the currents move this way and move any ice into the Canadian Arctic. As long as there is ice, it will be pushed into the Canadian archipelago. So my ice navigators and Canadian Coast Guard and U.S. Coast Guard will be working in the ice long after the Russians are due to climate change. If we get to a point where there is no ice in the Arctic, quite frankly, the human race is due because the average temperature in the, the planet will have raised so high that it will also be causing major melt in the Antarctic and the sea level rise will be dramatic. We're already seeing that. I'm, just, I'm keeping out of the, the Antarctic picture for today. Okay, but what I want to get across to you is, with climate change that's going on, it's not necessarily as severe as may be put out. The ice is still there. It's still a challenge for shipping. You can't go charging through Northwest Passage as if it's a highway. And we won't be able to do it for decades to come. So part of the reality is this was 2016 and this is actually a representation of a radar sat image. And if we flip back to that, 2012, they were saying 2016 was not too different. There we are. There's ice all through the Canadian archipelago. It's right against the Russian Arctic. And there's this piece right here. And I want to bring in to that. That's what it looked like. That's the northernmost point of the continental United States, at Diakvik, used to be called Point Barrel. And the ice, this heavy orange, which is multi-year ice up to two and a half, three meters thick, extended right down along the coast in the middle of what is normally the ice-free season on the north slope of Alaska. For three and a half weeks, ships would normally scoot by there and get in to the eastern Arctic. They were trapped. They couldn't move. And this is in one of the least ice years. And this massive tongue sat down along the coast. And it wasn't just 2016. This past summer, in 2018, this period is the 10th of September, right in the period of time when it should be the most open, the ice-free summer. Where's the Mackenzie mouth there? That's the Mackenzie. Okay, thank you. That's Alaska. Yep. Franklin came to grief right here. That's the copper mine or the Bathurst Inlet. <laughs> this is the southern route. Most shipping comes through here. It was solidly blocked through all of Victoria Strait, yeah. Peel Sound, up into Lancaster Sound. Cruise ships were turned back for the first time in 10 years. Resupply ships couldn't make it into Cambridge Bay. We, we might have seen it if you're watching the news. I'm not sure if it was carried in the Times Columnist. I was in the Arctic at the time. Um, but uh, there are people that uh, have paid for their brand new uh, four-wheel drive truck, and they won't get it till next year because the ship couldn't get in to deliver it. You know, that's an example. And it wasn't just 
pickup trucks and, and four-wheelers. It was masses of canned food. It was fuel. The government of Northwest Territories is now spending millions flying in foodstuffs and fuel in bladders because the Arctic ice that everybody said is going away didn't. It was there. It's good for my business. <laughs> and this is only 14 days later. Now it's also blocked up right up here, just east of the Mackenzie. It's a variability in ice conditions. It's not easy going. It's getting better, but not as good as a lot of people think. Myth number two, that the Northwest Passage and the Northern Sea Route across Russia, because they're shorter than going through the Suez Canal, and they're shorter than going through the Panama Canal, and because of global climate change, they're going to become the highways, are becoming the highways. And we see, even three weeks ago, the Northern Sea Route increased by 25% the tonnage through the Northern Sea Route. Well, 25% of 10 ships, it's not 25% of thousands of ships that go through the Suez Canal. It's not 25% of thousands of ships that go through the Panama Canal. And the vast majority of the tonnage that actually goes through the Northern Sea Route and Northwest Passage isn't transit, it's destinational. Many of the voyages that we've seen over the last 10 years, um, this past year, Maris sent uh, the, the first container ship through the Russian Arctic. Oh my God, we're going to have container ships going through. Well, they sent it through after many years of planning. They found out that it got stopped by the ice. So they're not going to run one again for another 10 years because container ships have to sail on a day and get in on a day. Everything is liner. It's day to day to day. Ice slows you down. Ice stops you. Destinational traffic in and out of the Arctic, in and out of the Antarctic is increasing. But that makes sense because of basic demographics. Over time, the small communities that exist all through the Arctic Circle are slowly growing. When I first went to the Arctic, the village of Polituk had 300 people. Well, the village of Polituk is now a town of Polituk with 1,500 people. When you go from 300 to 1,500, you're consuming more groceries, you're consuming more fuel, the resupply of the community has to increase, and it has dramatically throughout the entire Arctic. So what we call resupply has been growing incrementally every year. We also see exploration. The biggest particular driver, as I mentioned a little while ago, was the EDE, Exploration, Development and Export work in the Russian Arctic. Russia's entire economy depends on one thing. That's hydrocarbons coming out of the Arctic. They're spending billions to save themselves. What does that EDE mean? Exploration, Development and Export in the hydrocarbons. So going up, drilling for oil, drilling for gas, exploiting that gas and exporting that gas. The biggest numbers in increases in the northern sea route traffic in Russia are related directly to EDE. Millions of tons of modules going into the Amal Peninsula in order to liquefy the natural gas. Millions of tons of port facilities to load that natural gas on ships. And now they're exporting 170,000 cubic meter ice class ship every two and a half days transiting either to Asia or to Europe with liquefied natural gas. That's what's increasing traffic. In Canada, there is this big panic because, oh my God, the traffic doubled in one year. And if I go back to Beck saying, yeah, where's Duke gone? Well, those first few years have been on what's called the Baffinland export. In 2015, the first export ships of the highest grade iron ore in the world started coming out of Milne Inlet in uh, northern Canada. And now there are 70 voyages a year coming out of that mine. That's where the increase is. It's not the highway across the north. It's stuff going out, stuff coming in. So that mine has to be resupplied to get all <coughs> the stuff out. So it's in and out, in and out. Community resupply we talked about, both in Russia and in Canada. 
So number three is everybody gets very, very worried about wild cowboys going through heedlessly uh, threatening <laughs> to pollute the oceans and that sort of thing. Well, I know and my team knows and the regulators know and the shipping industry knows that the vast majority of operators in of the Russian Arctic and the Canadian Arctic and the Arctic in general are experienced Arctic mariners and ship operators. The ships are well found, they're designed for it, they, they, the, the people are trained. That's why my company exists because those companies want to make sure they've got the best trained, experienced ice operators with their crews. It's not that which is the threat, it's these guys. <laughs> now, this particular thing, this was called the the Alton Girl, and she was stopped by the Canadian Coast Guard coming through the Northwest Passage and was, was warned to desist on further voyage. She was stopped off Point Barrow and was finally uh, ordered to cease her voyage by the U.S. Coast Guard. That's Alaska, right? Yes. The engine in that boat came out of the cooling plant of a shipping container. It's the sky is falling stuff that comes around these people. Two years ago, the Canadian Coast Guard reported uh, 30 voyages through the Northwest Passage. Everybody panicked, 30 voyages. 18 of them were partial voyages of boats like this. What, what kind of boat is it though? Like, just I would call boat? it a coffin. <laughs> Was he it's a pleasure like, boat. It's a pleasure boat. Okay. Um, it's uh, an echo wacko. It's uh, oh my gosh. It's a uh, an adventure. Right. Um, let's call them adventures. <laughs> uh, they've read the book out of uh, Pacific Yachting where so and so did it, and they're going to do it now. <coughs> when I was in the Canadian Coast Guard and the icebreakers, um, every year we would be risking our crews to save people like this who go up without knowing what they're doing. These are the ones that add to the statistics. The Alliance Corporation every year issues uh, insurance figures for what it calls the Arctic region. <laughs> and uh, the, the figures were often quoted of showing a massive increase in incidents in, in the Arctic. Well, what people didn't look at was the statistics were based predominantly on one of the most dangerous uh, industries in the world, which is a television notoriety, mm -hmm. the Bering Sea fishing industry. And those incidents based around the, the, the true wild cowboys of the sea in the ice fishing industry taint the rest of the industry. In the Canadian Arctic, the incidents have been very, very rare uh, of damage and grounding. And uh, there's usually a pattern that comes to them. But when we look at the existence of wild cowboys, <laughs> it's adventures. And they're almost impossible to stop. So well, that's in a marina somewhere, right? Because there's another no, sailboat there. There's another that's sailboat along the shoreline there. No, behind it. Right there's there. no sailboat. That is okay. no, 35 it. miles. That is 35 that's miles off Point Barrow. There is nobody there but that ship oh. and the U.S. Coast Guard cutter. He is well, so what's the rope that's tied to another ship then? You're pulling it or something. The rest of it. No, that right there? Yeah, that line. That's the line to the icebreaker that's trying to save the line. <laughs> The truth is, the players that are up there are operating well-found ships. Canadian ship, um, operated by FedNav, one of the most experienced Arctic shippers in the world, one of our clients. Uh, Russian ship working on the uh, Norilsk Nickel Run, one of the most powerful ice-breaking cargo ships in the world. Uh, Degagne tankers, operating the sea lift, all double-skinned, all Arctic hull, all icebreakers of their own right. And this little beauty right here is the new Ponant ice-breaking cruise ship. She will be the first what's called PC-3, and that's the, uh, the highest ice class in the world is a PC-1. And that ship is a PC-7. This is going to be a PC-3. It's an icebreaker in its own right. Just quickly, who would build that ship? Would that be a German ship? That one right there is actually being built uh, in a Danish yard to a Finnish design. Interestingly, uh, the Finns have designed 85% of the ice-breaking ships in the world, 
and up until the last 10 years built 60% of them. Uh, this ship uh, is a Canadian-owned, Canadian concept, but designed and built in Japan. Uh, this is Finnish designed, Russian built, and that is German designed, German built. There's a lot of experience out there in ice class as opposed to ice breaking. Ice breaking are ships that can independently operate in ice up to three meters thick, depending on their ice class. Ice strengthened are typically cargo ships that have stronger steel, thicker steel, their frames are closer together, they have more horsepower, they have a stronger propeller, that sort of thing. This baby here has some of the thickest steel in a passenger ship ever put on a, a, an expedition ship. And uh, when I last heard it, it has uh, three azimuthing thrusters. The modern way of building a, a ship to be effective in both open water and ice is what we call double acting. And this ship is a perfect example of it. Typically in open water it will go bow first because the bow is designed to go through the open water hydrodynamically and, and it's effective. But it turns it around and it goes stern first in the ice. Mm -hmm. Because a, a bow that's good for ice, like that, doesn't do well in an open ocean. So what we're seeing now is more double acting ships. Big, heavy, ice breaking sterns. The ship in the left bottom corner there is less for moving like oil drilling rigs and things like that? Close that's uh, for supplying uh, Arctic diesel and jet fuel to Arctic communities. Well, that's so it loads up in Montreal and, and goes up. It and its sisters, there's four of them that go up every year and they go about five, six trips into the Arctic resupplying communities. But by the Eastern Arctic? In the Eastern Arctic. The Western Arctic is resupplied by fuel barge down the Mackenzie and then out that way. So, what are we looking at? The new players, they're not just going up there and willy-nilly. They're not just arriving. They're planning. They're taking time to plan these things. Uh, there was a lot of press a few years ago about the Nordic Orion, the first cargo ship to go through the Northwest Passage. Well, in fact, it wasn't the first cargo ship. Uh, it just happened to be the first one that said, yes, we're going and we want to make a press deal about it. There had been two others before it. Three years of planning, three years of consulting with uh, the U.S. Coast Guard, the Canadian Coast Guard and Transport Canada, planning, execution. They haven't come back since because it's not worth it. Going through the Northwest Passage, it saved time. It saved some fuel until they got into that. But the insurance costs and the delays in time ate up the savings. Were they planning going up to Northumberland Channel? That upper route there? No. Rare route. Northumberland isn't one that would normally be used. This particular one was the beauty of uh, the press, the Crystal Serenity. Um, our company was peripherally involved with some of the planning on this. Um, a group that we worked with chartered the ship to go along with her. Again, four years of planning, four years of working with the agencies. Um, the Crystal Cruises chartered their own icebreaker to go with them. The icebreaker carried extra uh, survival gear, extra pollution response gear. They made it through. They did one more cruise and they said, that's it. They very nearly didn't make the second cruise because of the ice and the low ice class of this ship. What they're doing is they're building much smaller ships, more like that one we saw from Conant, mm. that aren't going to be carrying a thousand passengers. They'll be around PC5. We get in here. And they'll be going through in 2021. Hmm. But the planning that went into this before this voyage was even attempted was absolutely amazing. There were two ice navigators on board this ship. <coughs> on every bridge watch, there was a master, a captain, a second captain, a senior officer, and a second officer, plus an ice navigator. There were two ice navigators. We supplied the ice navigators on the support ship because they needed somebody experienced in ice breaking, and we put them there. And 1,500 passengers? No, 1,000. A lot of people. Yeah. That's actually a small cruise ship, but big for the Northwest Passage. 
what's happening now is we're getting to three to five hundred high ice class ships. This is another one. Uh, this one we have been directly involved in, and this is what I talked about earlier, uh, the Amal LNG project. Now, this ship is one of 16 being built, highest ice class cargo ships in the world. They're PC2. Uh, you can only get PC1 if you're basically a nuclear icebreaker with uh, uh, almost 100,000 horsepower. Uh, you're not going to get there with this. These ships are fully um, double acting. They do operate stern first in the ice. They can go through two and a half meters of ice on their own. So they will be operating in the Northern Sea Route exporting gas all year long. But That's interestingly, nice what they do is in the summertime, when it's open, they go to Asia. In the wintertime, when that's really tough, they go to Europe. They're operating 12 months, but they're not going through the northern sea route for 12 months. The amount of training, the amount of uh, design work, uh, we've been working with them for four and a half years, putting together their operations manuals, putting together their training programs. Um, We've been working with them most recently on uh, looking at uh, the viability of operating a, a large ice class cargo ship uh, through the Canadian Arctic. The biggest difference with the Canadian Arctic is the demographic buying. Russia doesn't have the same sort of population base in their Arctic that we do. So if we're going to propose any sort of, of uh, increase, major increase in, in hydrocarbon transportation through the Canadian Arctic. It's not just regulatory, but in Canada and the United States, we work very, very closely with our Indigenous people. And that's a huge part of the program that, that we're looking at now, is in the engagement, is this something that is worth pursuing at all or not? But my point in this is not to, to throw a, um, a fear of a, a major tanker going through Canadian waters. The chances are it's not likely going to happen because the studies are indicating the risks involved. There are major mitigating factors. And that's what I want to talk about here is when companies think about doing this, they look into the bits and pieces. They don't want to be the environmental catastrophe. They don't want to be the human catastrophe. So they do this sort of preparation, and we're involved with it all the time. Another one um, that I, I, I close out with, a lot of people have thought that there's no regulations, and this fancy thing that was invented by the, the, uh, the IMO, the International Maritime Organization in 2016, the Polar Goat, is going to solve all the problems and, and put in regulations. Well, the fact is, Regulations have existed, very strong regulations, coastal state regulations, for decades. In Canada, since 1972, when the Trudeau government enacted the Arctic Waters Pollution Prevention Regulations and the Act, and that has driven the most highly advanced uh, pollution protection, environmental protection regulations and shipping in the world, followed by Russian rules for nor uh, navigating the Northern Sea Route. These rules are very, very stringent but they were separate rules, Canada rules and Russian rules. What the Polar Code has done is, is build an international standard. But the rules have existed, and they still exist, and the Polar Code just brings other countries into line. Normally I'd, I'd fly through the Polar Code uh, a little bit, but what I want you to know is what it does, it, it's, it's like safety of life at sea, if any of you are aware of that that internationally, uh, out of the, uh, the UN, the IMO sets baseline standard. And in 2016, they're the first mandatory standard for shipping in polar waters. So every ship trading internationally that goes north of 60 or south of 60, depending on which pole you're at, for as for the first time, now has to comply with international regulations that are standard. The Canadian regulations are a little higher. The Russian regulations are a little higher, but countries can't have anything below that standard. The outline is this staffing regulations, uh, design regulations, uh, communication regulations? All of that. Uh, there are Chinese 12 chapters. I mean, uh, it goes into the basic construction of the ship, it goes into the standards on board the ship to take into consideration cold climate for 
uh, insulating galleys, for insulating Police cabins. So also be inspected for all this level of. The inspection is up to the, the individual states, but the, the rules for the construction of the ship and the design of the ships are there. Um, the rules for pollution protection are there. The rules for crewing are there. Uh, I'm flying off on Thursday uh, to the Mediterranean to teach a course to percent. mariners who now must be certified in polar waters training. So standards are there. It, it's not this wild, crazy place that nothing is happening. You know, the myth of the cowboys isn't there. The truth is people like myself and uh, the 25 of our team that travel around the world. It's not this mainly of ships smashing around. It's well-found ships operating in the Arctic. Thought there was a comment coming out there. So what do we see? Well, I don't see a doom and gloom. I see something that we have to be aware of, something that we, we bring home and, and try to tell the South that climate change is real. We've got to do something, because things are changing. They're not changing for the better, and they are very, very evident up there. This past summer, uh, I was on the Japanese research ship Mirai, working on what we call the interface between the heavy polar pack and open ice. And the reason we were there uh, in October and November is because there are more storms occurring in the Arctic than ever before. Is that because there are more storms or is it because we're more aware of the storms? The science isn't definitive yet. So we're trying to be in that area with on-scene observations, watching how the ice is forming. My job was to make sure the ship never got into ice, that we would always retreat as the ice came out. And we went up one morning, and I had uh, done my job, and Captain, the ice is going to be there, and we can't go any further. We got there, there was no ice. And I was absolutely gobsmacked. How can this be? The air temperature was minus 15, the seawater temperature had been minus 3, it was everything for ice. We, the winds were from the north, all of these things, all these bits and pieces. How can this possibly be? And then we took seawater tests. The seawater was 2.5 degrees plus. Absolutely, totally unheard of in the Chukchi Sea, north of Cape Barrow, in December. Absolutely unheard of. The first question is, is this because we're here to see it? And it's always been happening? And of course that was quickly thrown out because if it had always been happening, there would have been ice there from year to year, or no ice. The supposition, and of course the science has to go through this, but the supposition came around when they, they did the sampling in the ship, was the isotopes and the chemical signatures of the water in the column that were plus two was Atlantic water. And Atlantic water has been moving in from the Atlantic and coming around the Russian side for, since 1999. Hmm. And normally it stays under the thermocline. But something has caused that upwelling to occur and bring up this area. It was a massive circle of two degrees warm water, about 15 miles across that we found. Two days later it was gone. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, I could blame it on Tom. <laughs> it's these kind of things that, that we just, we're not getting a handle on. When you so you had mentioned um, oral history a little bit earlier. Yep. And I was wondering, are you working with the Inuit up there? I mean, Personally? Well, if anybody knows ice, they yeah. would, right? Well, uh, and uh, this is where I'm going to likely ruffle some feathers. Um, if everyone knows ice, the Inuit will know ice, is what you said. And to a degree, they will know ice relative to their perspective. And, and that's um, not the same as ice relative to a shipping perspective. And, and that's what we've found, is that the, the oral history about ice and what's good ice to them is not good ice to us. 
what's strong ice to them is something that a dog team can go over. So they would say a, um, a strong ice year, their dog sled can go anywhere. But that is absolutely not reflective of whether that's anything more than 35 centimeters in thickness. So the oral history gives us some indication, but it doesn't give us the full indication. Hmm. And that's the gap that we have. Um, they will count a, um, a good ice year as a year where the caribou can come across to King William Island. In the period uh, when Franklin came to grief, um, the ice was free, open, south of King William Island. The caribou weren't moving on to King William Island, but the ice was heavy on the north end. Franklin and the team come into the north end of King William Island, get trapped in the ice, but at the same time there's no ice down here. There's no caribou on King William Island. There's no caribou for Franklin's men to hunt in that period of time. Inuit populations were dying out as well at that time because of a lack of caribou. So utilizing from a shipping perspective, it's not quite apples and apples. It's apples and oranges. Um, some absolutely incredibly good oral history going on about all sorts of other things. Um, but from a shipping perspective, we found that doesn't translate quite so well. So, I mean, this is the kind of stuff we see. We see the ice is still there. We see heavy ice like this. Uh, and this was July of uh, 2017 coming through the Northwest Passage on a uh, heavy 30,000 horsepower icebreaker. It could get through it. A cruise ship couldn't. We see beautiful days like this that, from my point of view, are fantastic. That little crack is, we made that. <laughs> but from a hunter's perspective, that's the crack that is going to widen. Yeah. And he can't get his snow sled over. Mm -hmm. We have to share the water. We have to share the ice. We have to work together. This is what it's like, the first ship going into Milne Inlet. Rotten first year ice. Within four days, that's all gone. And that's typical. So where is this again? This is Northern Baffin Island, northeast coast of Canada. Northern Baffin Island. Yeah. So that's that nickel mine? Or? Iron mine. <coughs> Iron mine, right. Yeah. That's that Russian ship you're talking about? No, those are um, chartered in by Canadian. This is the Northwest Passage in 2017. Massive multi-year ice here all first year ice. Again, this was a heavy ice year off at Giacvik Point Barrow. Ships couldn't get through at that time. But it's not just about ice, it's about the wildlife. And like any place, wildlife comes and goes. I was uh, having dinner uh, with some friends from the University of Victoria who were doing some research work. Uh, in uh, the uh, Northwest Territories, and they had some of their um, local Inuit researchers down. They were talking about the decimated uh, muskox herds on Banks Island and how it was making it difficult for them to, to feed on country food. 250 miles east of there, massive herds. When they talked to their elders, they found out about the ebb and flow of wildlife. Entire communities would die off with the loss or the change in the, the migration patterns of the various food sources. And it still happens today. How much of that is due to anthropogenic change and how much of it is a natural flow? A little bit of both. But we have ways to watch this and see what's going on and mitigate it. We see the beauty of the northern lights that's tourism in a nutshell. People yeah. paying $25,000 US to go on a ship through the Northwest Passage. Wow. And then it gets stopped by the ice and they want their money back. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what I think is the future. These two young gentlemen joined us uh, when we came through the Northwest Passage in 2017 and a re um, positioning voyage of a Finnish icebreaker. They came from uh, the Eastern Canadian Arctic. They are students at the um, Marine and Fishery College in Inuvik. 
the first of, of uh, graduating class of young locals who are going to school to learn how to be mariners because they know that the ice from granddad's perspective is not the ice from Captain Duke's perspective. These two young fellows, for the first time in their lives, flew further than 700 miles, flew down to Ottawa and across to Vancouver, joined the ship in Vancouver, sailed through to Nuke, sailed with us, or flew with us from Nuke to Copenhagen, went absolutely crazy in Copenhagen, but didn't get into trouble, <laughs> and then flew home. One of them is the mate on an Arctic fishing vessel. And the other one went back to his home and is trying to start a remote school in his own village. Hmm. Absolutely amazing young men who, as part of a crew, an international crew, Canadian, Inuit, and Finnish, took a massive ship through the Northwest Passage and all the way through, everybody's learning from everybody. What I learned from these two young guys about what they see, how they see it, is totally different than how I or Captain Villanen saw it. But they were there to learn to become part of an industry that they know is vital to the future of their communities. Their communities will not exist without ships. Their communities will not exist without resupply. Their communities will not exist without being part of the bigger picture. But they know they need to teach us more about how we integrate with them. So let uh, me ask you, so these Finnish icebreakers, so they work opening up supply lines and burn up in the Baltic Sea in the winter? Is that how they work? The Finnish in the winter, uh, these particular ships are owned by area, right? a Finnish company called Arctia, and in the winter they work in the Baltic. Uh, this year, uh, it was, uh, this particular one is finishing a contract in the Russian Far East, and it was repositioning back to Finland. And the most effective way to do it was through the Northwest Passage, being an icebreaker, it could do it. It's, and so they have to keep the Northern Baltic Sea open, is that it? Because my That's daughter's right. moving to Finland in the summer for a year, and I'm getting real worried. <laughs> North of Helsinki, she's moving. I'm going, yeah, That's cake. like moving to the Yukon. No. no but it's, no. It's, it's, no. That all freezes. No, all, no, no. The no, ice no, no. Okay. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to have to call time yeah. on that. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly and I were well north of Helsinki, well north of 60 North. Kelly's bouncing around on a snowboard, and uh, Porsche does a driving school. Um, Europe climate and the Canadian Arctic climate are two totally different things. In 1976, I think it was, the Finnish government made a proclamation that every port in Finland will be kept ice-free 365 days a year. Okay. And to do that, it takes uh, seven or eight icebreakers operating 24 hours a day all through the winter. Wow. And they do it. There are 17 icebreakers working in the Baltic uh, in any given day. Uh, to keep between Swedish um, and Finnish and Russian ports open. Quite a bit different way of looking at things than we do. And this girl, huh? this, this queen of the Arctic, to me is the one that I really do want to get across. One of the most horrific things a lot of us saw some months ago was a video of a very, very sick polar bear that was bandied about and everyone said, see, this is climate change. What offended me as a human being was the people that were there that filmed the animal, A, didn't put that animal out of its misery. They filmed it and they touted it as an example of a, or a bear dying of hunger due to climate change. It had cancer, very virulent cancer. And when the, the animal control people went in and put the poor bear out of its misery, National Geographic put this much in the back page saying we were wrong. 225 miles north of Point Barrow, fat, happy, swimming, we saw tracks everywhere we went of bears. Just last week, the truth of the story of the Russian city that was uh, inundated by bears. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> the, the truth was they'd opened up their garbage dump and the bears were coming in for the dump 
<laughs> the same problem that a place called Churchill had 20 years ago. Bears were coming into the village because they had an open pit garbage dump and it was easy food. And the bears were coming in, they weren't leaving when the ice left. And then they weren't getting food and they were dying. Until they cleaned up the garbage dump, they had problems with bears dying of hunger. So we have to find out what's the reality around this. What is the truth of anthropogenic change? What is the truth of climate change? It's happening. There are things happening that we don't want to see continue happen. But let's not stoke it with hyperbole and falsehoods. Let's look at it realistically and actually do what we need to do to fix this. Instead of just saying, well, it's all lies, like Donald Trump says, it's not real. It is real. But we need to get the real story out, not the fake one. We need to bring the Donald Trumps on side. Is this, you were pretty close to that bear? Is that what you're showing us that today? That bear was... <laughs> Looking at you, can we see your flexion? Is that... Thank you. Me to you. Wow. Um, with the Japanese research ship, uh, Mirai, again, we were stopped doing a deep water cast 3,000 meters down, um, about a half a mile from the ice flow that she came off. And uh, she came up, she just swam around the ship. Mm -hmm. Just, mm, I like sushi. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it's, it's interesting, we see, we see bears quite a bit in the Canadian Arctic and for the most part they are in good physical shape. So that's a sign, yeah. Wondering uh, how you became interested in being a mariner, was your, you know, your father a mariner, were you in the maritimes, were you actually born in the Arctic? How did you become so passionate about your, uh, in ten words? Uh, my father dropped me on my head when yeah. I was <laughs> uh, Very shortly, uh, I skipped school one day uh, and went down to the recruiting center in London, Ontario to join the Air Force. Um, couldn't fly an airplane because of my glasses and the guy said, hey, there's this really cool thing called Mars, Maritime Surface Subsurface mm -hmm. Officer, and I joined up the uh, Canadian Armed Forces as a midshipman. Uh, did two years in the Navy, left the Navy, went into the Coast Guard, and in 1982, my captain said, you should go to the Arctic. And my father had flown in the Arctic in the RCAF in the 1950s and 60s doing um, Arctic mapping hmm. and uh, search and rescue. And I, I called him up and I said, Dad, do you think I should do this? And he said, you're the stupidest son of a bitch in the world if you don't. He said it was the most exciting work that he'd ever done in his life of flying from you know, World War II and Korea. Mm. And from there on in, it is history. Uh, I, I spent a couple of years in the Navy, uh, a great many years in the Coast Guard, left the Coast Guard, came back to the Coast Guard. And, and, and it, as Kelly can well attest to, uh, I caught the Arctic bug hook, line, and sinker. And I, I'm incredibly fortunate that um, I am able to be paid for what I love to do. And we've been able to pull together a team of like-minded mariners in Martek Polar. Uh, we're all pretty wacko. We've had our brains frozen and we're bipolar Arctic and Antarctic and love doing what we're doing. We're all committed to getting ships in and out of the ice safely. Um, we will not let you get your ship get dented. Our unofficial model is we don't dent ships. <laughs> we don't dent ships. Well, being safe, of course, I have to ask you a technical question. So, I read a report recently, the deviation of the magnetic north is rather accelerated. A little so how bit. do you deal with that? I mean, what's, what's going on? Don't deal with it at all. Magnetic north. Don't you deal don't with it anymore. Don't care. The GPS. No. We, we, in fact, we haven't cared about the compass in decades in the Arctic. Because as soon as you get up around 72 north, the compass is useless anyway. Yeah. So the fact that the, the, the north magnetic pole is not here, it's over there now. Um, you know, yes, when I was a young man and my beard was red and I had hair on the top of my head, we would always do a gyro to compass error, yeah. but that gyro to compass error changes every mile. Deviation, yeah. And, and, and the whole thing, because of that deviation, because of that magnetic error. Um, what's happening now is, yes, it's sped up, but there is also signs that it has sped up in the past. And we also know 
geologically, the North Pole used to be at the South Pole. So, you know, to say that, oh my God, there's this massive navigational issue coming up, uh, any one of us, no. Um, we've been using um, different types of gyro compasses. Stan we don't use standard gyro compasses anymore because they have another issue with rotating. We use fiber optic compasses. We use different types of compasses. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the fact that the, the magnetic pole is changing doesn't affect anything at all. Don't you use GPS technology? Uh, we use GPS. We use GLONASS. We use the uh, uh, Galileo system. There are three operational satellite systems. Uh, the Chinese okay. system is about to come online. They're all somewhat similar, and uh, most ships will use systems that will pick both or two of the satellite yes. navigation mm -hmm. systems, so you've always got something. Uh, the, the problem with navigating in the polar regions is that uh, we're only now getting all the charts up to the same datum, uh, so that uh, instead of using a datum that relates to 1852, on a chart that Franklin went through, we need a datum that's related to 1983, which is what all the satellites use. Mm -hmm. So mariners, if they're using a paper chart, when they're going through uh, a region of either pole, they'll, they'll make sure they look at the chart and see what its latitude and longitude is based on, and then they'll change the numbers coming out of their GPS to match. If you don't, you can jump two or three miles. Wow. Uh, that can still happen. On electronic charts that we're using nowadays on uh, electronic chart display systems, you know, the big TV screens, uh, it all does it all automatically. Yeah. <laughs> so the most important question, what's your favorite sea shanty? The Barrett's West Privateers. <laughs> yeah, Barrett's Privateers, because that's what I sang when I, I was in Halifax as a midshipman, but uh, um, <laughs> Northwest Passage. That's got to be. It's a good one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, <I'm> just saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, the acoustics here are fantastic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Stan Rogers passing away in that Air Canada crash yeah. just broke my heart. So, yeah. So. Do you see a lot of killer whales up there? I saw National Geographic special, which the killer whales are now moving in on narwhals and chasing them around because uh, they now have a new hunting pattern because of leads in the ice. So the killer whales were chasing them around. I'm going, okay, so they're very entrepreneurial, these, narwhals, these killer whales. They always have been. Um, I personally have not seen any killer whales in the Canadian Arctic. Okay. I understand that they've been seen in Hudson's Bay and the southern Davis Strait. I don't know. Well, that's in the crazy. Antarctic, they are there. Uh, and uh, The penguins, you know, right? Because I was focusing mostly on the Arctic. Um, when we broke the channel into McMurdo in 2018, um, 18 miles in the ice, uh, we were surrounded by minke whales and orchids, and it was the most magical thing in the world as the ship's moving in and out of this 18-mile-long path in the ice to resupply the McMurdo Station in the Antarctic. There'd be a dozen spy-hopping orcas coming up, coming down, coming up, coming down. And they're looking for their number one meal, the penguins or the seals would always be just over here on the ice. It's just absolutely amazing. You talk about uh, nature, red in tooth and claw, and there it was in, in Technicolor. But uh, <laughs> hundreds uh, of uh, orcas in the, the South Atlantic. Uh, but I haven't seen any in the, the Arctic. That's what I just don't understand, because we have this big issue with orcas here on the coast, that uh, because there's a lack of coho, they're just dying out. And meanwhile, there's this huge increasing herds of sea lions, seals. Porpoises are visiting, visiting BC waters now. And, and yet you hear that these orcas don't want to eat anything else except schnook. I'm going, well, in other environments, they, they eat penguins, they, they eat narwhals, uh, they, they adopt. I, so I don't quite understand the mechanism there. I, I, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a biologist. Well, I, mean, yeah. I do know, all I know about the BC is um, between the uh, transient orcas and the resident orcas, and, and I can never remember which one eats what, but one eats fish and the other yeah. one eats seals, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and never the twain shall meet. They don't, and I, I can't answer yeah. anything more than that. Um, but I, I do know that everywhere we go, when, when water temperature changes, the critters living in the water change. Uh, and, you know, that's just a, a fact of life. And um, it, if the orcas are moving out of the Strait of Georgia, um, is that because of Mankind in boats, or is it because the waters 
two and a half degrees warmer, and the feed they're feeding on is gone. I, I don't know that. I don't have those answers. Um, no, it's just a big issue around here. Yeah. We used to have mastodons everywhere, but you don't have them anymore. <laughs> it's, it's been we could bring them back. Oh, God. I don't, I, they might be good eating. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I think we've run them. Is there one in the back? Okay. I think we've run a dry bed. Nobody's asked you if you've eaten blubber, right? I think we've done some it's good eating. Ones. Blubber. You've eaten raw uh, blubber? Yeah, I absolutely have. Muck duck. Muck duck. duck. It's like um, salty bacon fat. Ooh. Like pork belly, wouldn't it? <laughs> like pork belly, yeah. That's what I've always thought it must be like pork belly. Which everybody loves here now. Pork <laughs> belly is the same. You cook it raw. You right? eat it raw. You don't cook it right. We could put muck duck in there and nobody would yeah, ever notice. No, <laughs> Thank you very much, Beck. Thank you. <laughs>